Thank you so much for joining us today uh, for the 10th in the ongoing Physicians for Human Rights PHR webinar series, uh, where we've been examining the COVID-19 pandemic through the lens of health and human rights. I'm told that we have 600 people live with us today. Um, I have the good fortune of knowing many of you, but for those who are new to us, I'm Donna McKay, the Executive Director of PHR. For the last 10 weeks, we've been bringing together physicians and scientists and other experts on a wide ranging set of topics that seek to bring science based analysis and approaches to help guide the responses to this massive public health pandemic. In fact, PHR's guidance and expert advice has been in unprecedented demand since the pandemic began. People all over the world are looking to scientists and doctors and other health workers for guidance and leadership as never before. And PHR is grateful to be able to bring experts together and provide a platform so that many more people worldwide can experience the protection and benefit of their medical expertise. And clearly, we're living in a time in which facts, science, and evidence are sometimes pushed aside or even openly challenged exactly at the moment when global threats to health and well being require science driven and medically sound decision making with more urgency and higher stakes than ever in my memory. Over the last few months, life as we normally have known it has been shut down to slow the spread of the coronavirus. In addition to severe illness, people around the world have struggled with isolation from friends and family, job uncertainty about the future. People and governments around the world are now just wrapping their heads around what reopening looks like, both from a policy perspective, as well as a practical perspective, and most importantly, from a, a public health perspective. It's a complicated situation. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of benefiting from public health and medical experts who've been involved in shaping this debate, particularly in the US and Europe. And they will discuss how we must carefully balance public health safety and human rights to effectively reopen. I'm really excited to get started. Uh, we welcome your questions throughout today's briefing, so please send questions to webinar at phr.org, or you can just submit them to the Q&A box, and we'll do our very best to address them later in the session. I'm thrilled and I'm also honored to welcome today's moderator, Dr. Jennifer Leaning, Professor of the Practice of Health and Human Rights at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Dr. Leaning is an Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine at Harvard Medical School and former uh, Director and now Senior Fellow at the FXB Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard University. She's also one of PHR's founding board members and is now a member of PHR's Advisory Council. As a member of this council, Dr. Leaning and other leading experts in medicine and law and science provide guidance in PHR's work at the intersection of these three fields. Dr. Leaning's research focuses on human rights, international humanitarian law, and to humanitarian crisis. Um, I, for one, am very excited for today's conversation, so I'm turning it over to you now, Dr. Leaning. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Donna. Uh, I think we're going to be on a first name basis here for the remaining session. Um, it is such a pleasure to um, be invited to take part in this panel and um, PHR has been um, not just close to my heart for much of my adult life, but has been formative in terms of how I approach many problems and uh, understanding of the world. So uh, it's a privilege to be with you all. Uh, I am very pleased to be um, on this panel with two very distinguished colleagues. And uh, we'll begin by uh, giving some brief remarks and then introducing both of them, and then we will engage in the discussion. Um, my brief remarks relate to the title of this panel, which is Reopening, colon, Balancing Public Health, Safety, Human Rights, and the Economy. Um, this is a big topic, okay? And, and let me begin by observing that major crises always reveal deep fault lines in a society, always. Sudden and persistent crises like this pandemic do so not just for one country, but for countries all over the world. And the fault lines may lie along different social or historical tensions, but they're always present and they eat away at efforts to contribute, and create or maintain just and humane conditions for ordinary people. 
the discussion today will assume and refer to these fault lines, but it engages in an added set of complexities, which are indicated in the title, how um, in a major public health crisis to balance conflicting demands between and among very large social goods or enterprises. These goods and enterprises in the title for today can be framed by establishing some common parameters uh, for what each noun or non phrase actually means in the context of a massive pandemic whose very parameters are still not fully understood. So ensuring the health of populations requires understanding the biology and transmission pathways of major harm to people and the modes of intervention. So in this case, COVID-19. Responsibility for ensuring population health resides mainly with government authorities at all levels, although it is expected that informed individuals in their own context will act to promote their own health and the health of their communities. Safety in this context means protection of individuals and populations from the specific threat and indirect harms of COVID-19. Measures to implement safety could be taken by government authorities or by individuals. Human rights, as we all know, is a concept embedded in international and national law with elaborated normative definitions and applications. In this context, it stands, at least as I see it, as a barrier to the imposition of draconian measures that states might take to protect populations from harm at the expense of individual freedoms and needs. The economy is a vast enterprise in which people find their livelihoods. The economy can be arranged in ways that shore up people when they lose their jobs, that is company unemployment insurance, state-based insurance programs, social safety nets. Lockdowns or quarantines in the context of COVID-19 expose those countries that leave many people to fend for themselves. So here on this panel, we are all physicians who work in public health and we're familiar with the tenets and applications of human rights. We know that in many instances, trying to ensure the health of populations can be perceived as infringing upon um, human rights principles. Um, and we are now living in the midst of that framework, the balance between uh, public health and human rights principles, where governments around the world have imposed restrictions in various ways. This panel takes place as the protection of public health looms ever larger as a barrier to fulfillment of what individuals and large groups of people need and want to do. Go back to work, go back to school. The conflicts lie in the realm of economics and human rights, as well as in various possible strategies for ensuring public health. <clears throat> These tensions, I know, will be illuminated in our discussion today. Um, I'm now very honored to introduce this panelists um, two leading authorities in public health, Dr. Ashish Jha and Dr. Martin McKean. Um, Ashish is the KT Lee Professor of Global Health at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health and Director of the Harvard Global Health Institute, a university-wide institute, which provides him with a perfect platform to comment and um, opine on a wide range of issues. And he's particularly prominent now in his role in terms of talking to public policymakers and government officials about um, the issues uh, we're concerned with today. He's a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and a practicing general internist. His um, background is in improving quality and cost of healthcare systems, so in health policy, but he um, ambles widely um, and deftly among a realm of different issues in public health, um, led groundbreaking research uh, around the Ebola epidemic and is, as I said, in the front lines of COVID-19 response. He's providing very sage advice to US policy workers and elected officials. And he's authored um, a number of articles. Um, and he is really, really urging the government to let data and science drive the strategies for public um, response and protection. Dr. Martin McKee is professor of European public health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine and he's research director of the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies. Uh, Martin is a polymath in terms of uh, his understanding of the world and of knowledge about public health 
um, not just um, with a focus on the UK, but Europe and other uh, parts of the world as well. Um, he was founding director of the European Center on Health of Societies in Transition, which is a WHO collaborating center, and he formerly served as president. Uh, his research focuses on health determinants, with particular attention to social change, alcohol, tobacco, and nutrition, health system performance, and the relationship between health and the economy. Uh, he's written extensively on a wide range of topics. Um, it's almost as if there is a letter or an essay by him in the BMJ or the Lancet every week. Uh, and uh, they're all sound and excellent articles. Uh, he's um, joined a coalition of the world's leading doctors in signing an open letter to the British government to require protective measures, including masks, for citizen safety. Uh, so both of um, these panelists uh, have been uh, working on issues of public health um, in many parts of the world and within their own country for a long time. And um, I'm it, going to ask each of them to, um, to respond to this question. I, I will turn to Ashish first, okay? Um, so could I begin by asking you, Ashish, um, to assess the pandemic response and public health concerns about the next phases in the, in the United States. Public health response and the concerns about the next phases, which would include reopening. Yeah, so <clears throat> Jennifer, thank you. And uh, thank you to the entire PHR community for inviting me. And it is um, an incredible honor to be on with both Martin and Jennifer, both of whom I've known for a while and, and have learned from. So uh, it's, a, it's a great privilege. Let me start off by answering your question about where we are in the US. And uh, it is hard not to begin with the data and the data are quite damning. Um, America has about a third of all the cases in the world and almost 100,000 Americans have already died of this disease and we are still in the early days. And so if that's the data, the question is why? And it's because we have had as a country, I would argue, an abysmal response. Uh, the abysmal response begins in January. Uh, you could argue that it begins years ago when we decided that public health was not a priority and we were gonna dismantle many of the infrastructures. But of course, uh, for this pandemic, it begins in January where we had a federal leadership that for six to eight weeks uh, denied the existence of this pandemic, suggested it was nothing more than the flu, and did everything it could to make sure the country wasn't prepared. And so by the time March rolled around and we had many, many tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of cases already, uh, and when reality became uh, too much to ignore, um, we, were, we started uh, pretty flat-footed. And so what has happened is the last two months, the country has been largely shut down. Uh, nearly 40 million Americans have lost their jobs. Um, as I said, nearly 100,000 Americans have lost their lives. And the failures have been, have been several. Um, but then I will kind of end on a bit of a positive note where I see some lights, not just all bad news. Uh, but certainly we've had a terrible time getting a testing, tracing, isolation infrastructure up in place. We've had very mixed communication from the White House about what to expect and how to move. Um, a lot of undermining of policies uh, by the president. And ultimately, I think a country that is somewhat confused, not wholly, most Americans understand how serious this is, but at least some chunk of Americans confused about exactly what we're facing. And the other thing I like to try to remind people, uh, just to use a baseball analogy, and I'll apologize to Martin for a baseball analogy here, but um, is that this, if this is a nine inning baseball game, and we hope it's a nine inning and not an extra innings game, uh, we're probably in the top of the third inning of that game. Uh, we have quite a ways to go before this whole thing is over. And it's only over once we have a vaccine. Uh, the last thing I'll say, Jennifer, is that it's always hard to compare America to Europe because America is very large and very diverse. And there are parts of the US response that I think have been quite good. And, and, and California and Ohio and Maryland. And, uh, and then though there were initial delays uh, later in Massachusetts and New York 
So there's been quite a mixed response in the US and America has not been super monolithic. Partly the failure of the federal response has allowed for states to step up. It's not. Um, so we are now at a point where the country is opening up again. And some of that opening up is really being driven by data and science uh, and being done very carefully. And other places are moving much faster. And what that means in cases and deaths uh, I think are, uh, we will find out. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is really a country that is a patchwork and a patchwork response to a pandemic, uh, I think we're learning is maybe not the optimal approach uh, to how we respond to a global pandemic. So why don't I maybe stop with that as a set of framing thoughts and then uh, turn it back to you, Jennifer. Thank you, Thank you Ashish, very much. I mean, there, you, you bring up um, another issue which I think really is important for public health response, which is the, the grave uncertainty that still attends um, our lives and our sense of what we as individuals, let alone as policymakers or doctors, need to consider. There's a tremendous amount of uncertainty um, still ahead. Um, Martin, please, your assessment from where you sit or stand. Well, obviously, from a European point of view, we have to an even greater degree than you have in the United States, we are a natural laboratory. We have 53 countries in the WHO European region, 27 countries in the European Union, and if we include the European Economic Area and the European Union, about, 30, uh, about 32 countries there. And each of them have adopted different policies, but even more richly than that, within countries we've seen different policies. So there are four football teams, four nations in the United Kingdom, uh, each doing some things that are similar, but some things that are separate. Uh, so I got the football in the association football to combat the baseball there, Ashish. And uh, in Italy, we have the 21 regions, again, very big differences uh, in Spain and in France. We also see those variations and in Germany. So we've, been, we've had a huge opportunity to well, of course, as you know, we have a special relationship between the United Kingdom and the United States. And uh, we have been living up to that special relationship by competing with you for the highest number of deaths. You are ahead of us at the minute. We have about 33,000 that are officially recorded. But the Financial Times and others looking at the excess mortality, the all-cause excess mortality that we think is a much better measure, is about 66,000, so it's about double the official figures. And this is really quite alarming. But fortunately, we do seem to be turning the corner on that. But that is with very stringent restrictions on movement. And the worry now is that as we come into summer and people are moving away from that and the government is giving out very confusing messages, um, one step forward, two steps back, difficult to know what's happening. We're worried that that could very quickly turn around. And... However, as we look across Europe, we do have some really good examples. Austria, Germany, Czech Republic, Slovakia moved quickly. And this is the lesson I think we've learned more than anything else. Shutting down even four or five days earlier would, make, would have made a huge difference. And in fact, as we saw in the New York Times, I think it was today, an mm -hmm. estimate that you could have reduced the uh, death rate in the United States very substantially. We could have two in the United Kingdom if we had done what some of the other countries had done. But then we have that regional variation. The interesting is how in a country like Italy, uh, they did have a terrible situation at the beginning, but it was in a small number of northern regions in Lombardy and Emilia-Romagna, uh, Val d'Aosta particularly, and they were able to stop that spreading to the rest of the country, unlike the situation in the United Kingdom, where we have a much more generalized epidemic now. Thank you. Um, so um, let me come back to you, Martin. Um, with a question that she um, would be very interesting, your response as well. But uh, Martin, um, what are your public health concerns now about the readiness to open up? You um, conveyed a sense of uh, concern about it, but could you unpack that? What are the issues in how one might open up the British economy and the school system? Yeah, well, that's something that we're agonizing over at the minute. It's quite clear that before we do open up anything, we need to have a well-functioning 
tracking, testing, tracing uh, infrastructure in place. We are a long way from doing that. One of the problems is that in the last decade, perhaps more than a decade, the United Kingdom has uh, adopted a policy whereby if the government has a, a difficult problem, it goes to one of the outsourcing companies, Circo, G4S, the big accountancy companies like Deloitte, and hands it over to them to sort it out. Now, these companies are very good at doing things on a large scale that are very simple. So when they wanted extra hospital capacity, they could take an exhibition center, fill it full of hospital beds, put some ventilators in it, put some room dividers and so on. That was great. The challenge of bringing in the staff and getting them to work together, no, you can't do that. That's far too difficult. The same with our laboratory capacity. Now we were able to cope because of a superhuman effort by people working in the National Health Service, turning operating theatres into intensive care units and so on. Very poorly recognised, that was what saved us. It wasn't these other solutions. Now despite years of seeing, watching these corporations fail time and time again, and some of you will remember the Olympics in London when the security was given to one of the companies, G4S, and the military had to come in to do it for them. But we have numerous other examples. We've done the same thing again. So we've handed over the contact tracing, the testing, and frankly, it is shambolic. And we have very grave reservations. In terms of schooling, well, I'm on an independent group, which is shadowing the official government's advisory committee. And we've just last week published our own report. We will be publishing one tomorrow on opening of schools. I won't pre leaving aside what that will say, uh, so I don't want to preempt that, but I'll talk my own personal point of view, uh, which is that uh, it would be premature to do that until we have all of these um, uh, safeguards in place. We absolutely recognize that children are suffering by not being in school. Their education is suffering, their psychological well-being is suffering, but it is incumbent on in the government to put in place means by which they can actually benefit from being in school. We need to be very clear that we should not be using schools simply as places to store children keep them out of the way, get them out of their parents' hair. They have to have an enriching educational experience. And we look at what Denmark has done, which has been to put a massive investment into the schools uh, to increase the, uh, uh, the space that they're working in, putting in extra washing facilities and all sorts of protective equipment, which in the UK we have not yet done. So uh, we're, um, we'll watch this space for our report, but you can get an idea as to where we're generally going with it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Ashish, our, our vulnerabilities, the testing issues, how to pace a reopening. I'm sure there's going to be regional strategies, but as you hinted at earlier, there are groups that are now disruptively taking things in their own hands. So the guidance from the state or the county may actually not be listened to, which is another issue of an acceleration of opening here. Yeah, so what's been really interesting to watch is what America looks like um, without a, a functioning federal government. Um, I, I don't know if interesting is maybe the, the best word, um, and I'm not sure I wanted to find out in the middle of the biggest pandemic in a century. Um, but what has happened is even when the federal government has done some things well, so for instance, the president's task force put out a guidance on opening up America again. And I had specific criticisms of the guidance. There were issues that were vague and there were uh, responsibilities that the federal government should have taken that they were handing over to the states. But despite that, it was generally directionally right. It was scientifically reasonably well-grounded. And it's been very interesting to watch the White House essentially abandon it more or less as soon as they released it. And then the president spend the upcoming sort of following weeks trying to undermine his own task forces uh, guidance. And what that has meant is that some states uh, have done a pretty good job, have still followed that guidance, built their own and, uh, and are following. And other states, as I alluded to earlier, have not. You know, on the issue of testing, this has been one of the most puzzling to me. And I have been spending a lot of time talking to policymakers on the left, right, and center. And everybody agrees that we just need a lot more testing capacity in the United States. Uh, there has just really been, uh, uh, you know, no real intellectual disagreement on this. And yet the White House and the, and the federal government has been very reluctant 
uh, to help states figure this out and do this. And the problem is that 50 states all competing on a national and international supply chain for testing is not, has not been the most efficient way. And so what you have is, you know, New York and Massachusetts competing with each other for swabs uh, that are being manufactured in Italy. And, uh, you know, whatever your general feelings about competition, competition among states in a pandemic is not probably our ideal, uh, ideal approach. And I think at this point where we are is we're getting conglomerations of states. So you have a, a, a Northeastern state uh, strategy, you have a bunch of Midwestern states getting together, a bunch of Western states, and essentially we're recreating the United States in chunks, that kind of federal coordination. And, you know, it's a heck of, a, it's a heck of an interesting experiment. Uh, again, I don't think anybody thought this was kind of our preferred approach. But my sense, Jennifer, is that as we get into the fall, um, some of these uh, regional efforts will be pretty successful um, and we'll, we'll be able to stand up a reasonable testing infrastructure. We'll be able to have reasonably good policies. Um, but it's just, it's all been much, much harder than it should have been. And of course, the part that we haven't talked about yet is the massive effect it's had on every other part of, of the healthcare system. The fact that for months, people couldn't get the healthcare they needed. The fact that um, the healthcare system is under such massive financial stress, uh, that hospitals are laying off people in the middle of a pandemic, uh, that we're going into a fall where everybody's very anxious about what's gonna happen to patients with heart attacks and strokes and cancer, and can we provide care for all of them while still taking care of COVID patients. And, and everybody's sort of figuring this out on their own. And, and, um, and, and I think the health effects of, the, of this outbreak will far uh, go far beyond just the direct effects of COVID. And that's already becoming obvious. So there's a question from the audience, a couple of questions that relate to um, this issue of opening up and also the problem of a second wave. And uh, those are of course very related. Uh, so could we go a little bit deeper into the strategies for um, testing, contact tracing, um, and then what one does with people who test positive in the contact tracing? Uh, because I don't think that there has been, if there has been federal guidance, it has not been widely implemented. Um, and I'm asking now both for the UK and for um, the United States, but there is, um, a, it becomes quite local and intrusive. Uh, and there are, uh, um, at the moment I'm on an island uh, and uh, the, the contact tracing is going on very, very quietly, one doesn't know. Um, the hospitals have not been overwhelmed to put it mildly and they're very, there's only, they're only, there's only one on the island. And, um, and uh, there's a, um, an intimacy about it, which is actually quite good. It's local. And everybody is quite concerned. Mm -hmm. but, but if you take it more broadly, that, and you take it into a city, or, or let's not try a country. Ashish, you're right. This country is very big, the United States. It's hard to generalize. But if you take it into a state or a wider community or across the UK, um, how, does, how does contract tracing really take place? And what are the sort of things that are going to rattle people or make them upset if you're doing contact tracing? And how effective do you think it could actually be in the context of a larger population where there's not, there's not much of a community in many ways? Uh, could you just walk this one through? Because this was then going to relate to how are we going to begin to anticipate a second wave? Do we look at rehospitalizations? Do we look at an increase in the positives when we are doing contact tracing? Well, what are the parameters that we roll out and then the indicators we use in formulating policy? Martin. Well, I don't think that we have much to teach the world from the United Kingdom. As I said, we handed over the task to one of the big outsourcing companies and it's now subcontracting with a whole lot of other people but essentially the model where well a number of things that we're doing first of all we've attempted to develop an app 
um, which would use Bluetooth technology. And uh, if enough people were using it, it would communicate, each would communicate with each the other one. And it would provide information if you had been in contact with somebody who later proved to be positive. So it would have a record on your phone of everybody with whom you'd been in the, the vicinity. If they then tested positive, you would get a message. Now, we decided to do it ourselves. Uh, to develop a model, an ad hoc model. Uh, now, the United Kingdom, the British, the current administration here has a number of difficulties presentationally with information technology because as you, you may have heard about the Cambridge Analytica and the other companies that were involved in the Brexit referendum. And so therefore there is an, a, a considerable degree of distrust anyway before we start. But the idea that they had was that this would be a centralized system with all the information held centrally compared to virtually every other country in Europe. And in fact, I think every other country in Europe that has a decentralized system in which the information is just held on your own phone. So that looks like it's about to be abandoned uh, with the government hasn't been clear yet. So we may have to go back to the drawing board on that one. The contact tracing, well, uh, just before I came on the, the webinar, uh, I saw a, a story come up in The Guardian, which uh, suggests that one of the pilot areas is not going very well either. And we are doing this very much on the basis of call centers where people will telephone people and try and track them down. Now, the difficulty here is that you will have someone who is trying to describe their area, trying to describe their situation to somebody who's in a completely different part of the country with no real idea. The paradox is that ministers are fond of talking about shoe leather epidemiology, which is the traditional way of doing this, but there's no shoe leather involved at any stage in any of this. It is all done through mobile phones. Now, there are issues about who has a mobile phone and whether you can contact them and so on. But unfortunately, as we move into this phase and the government initially said it would have everything up and running by the 1st of June, we're very, very skeptical, I'm afraid. And I think many of us would have preferred a model in which the contact tracing was embedded in local communities, uh, perhaps. And we have a huge advantage over what you have in that we do have a primary care system where everybody is registered with a primary care center in their local area. So that covers uh, you know, overlapping geographical areas, but the people there know, they often know the patients and they know the environment. And if that was done, then I think it would be much better. The difficulty we've had is that we introduced reforms to the health service in England in 2012, which largely fragmented and dismantled that structure. There is a paper just out today in the British Medical Journal describing that, and that's made this very much more difficult than it would have been in the past. So Ashish, um, if you could expand um, from the perspective of the US and talk about some of these issues, about contact tracing, how is it done, shoe leather by phone, any other method. And secondly, um, it, it has to be accompanied with test by testing. And testing has been um, an extraordinarily dumb problem in the sense of uh, it costs money to test, but how much per person, how much for a country, um, at what level should the uh, strategy be implemented? Uh, and how could it be conducted relatively safely? Um, I don't think the United States has begun to do this well. Um, and it's a question from the audience. Like, what is the problem with not getting enough testing out there? Um, could, right. Can you share some light on this? Yeah, so let's quickly talk about the testing debacle that has been the US. And it's been getting better, um, but it's taken an extraordinary amount of work to get better. Um, the failures have been many, and, and they um, really started with the CDC initially messing up the initial test. And I could walk through all of the failures, but I won't because I'll give you what I think is the overall arching theme, um, which is that we've had a federal government that has not wanted to have testing because there has been this view that if you do a lot of testing, you'll find a lot of cases. And if you find a lot of cases, that will demoralize the markets and make the Dow Jones fall and the S&P fall, and that'll be bad for politics. And so, and, and this has gotten once many steps ahead of itself to almost a sense that testing is creating the cases. And I have been trying very, very hard to say, no, it's the virus that's creating the cases. The testing is only helping you find them and do something about it. Um, but, but not testing doesn't actually bring the pandemic to an end or create confidence in the marketplace that, that sickness doesn't exist. 
Um, but that's been the kind of major battle. And, and, and that mindset has permeated itself. In every single time there's a little barrier, it takes 10 times more effort to overcome it than it ought to. And uh, so, you know, there are all sorts of little issues that we've had problems with swabs, we have problems with reagents and machines and um, et cetera, et cetera. But nothing that you would think a country our size with our technical capacity, our financial resources could not solve very, very easily. And we just haven't. So what has happened now is that states have taken this on. States have come to realize that the federal government's not going to help. And we have some states doing a fabulous job. So you have... Uh, you know, Massachusetts, California, other states really making massive investments in testing infrastructure. And I think those states will get uh, up and running. You know, on contact tracing, it's been very interesting. Uh, so the leader on contact tracing actually has been Massachusetts and has been Charlie Baker. And they farmed it out not to a large consulting firm, but to a, a, an NGO called Partners in Health. And PIH has a long history of doing contact tracing, knows how to uh, do it in a way that is, um, you know, culturally sensitive and uh, has not worked in Massachusetts that much, a little bit, but not that much, but they're figuring it out. Um, there are other states uh, uh, that are using sheriff deputies to do contact tracing. And I think in general, that's a very bad idea because you're mixing in law enforcement with public health in a way that probably will not end you where you want to land. Um, so it's again, very, very piecemeal. Um, but I think we're making progress. And I think that where I am, at least, and where I think a lot of folks are, is that technology is a really important enabler, but it is no substitute for the human contact. And if you can't do shoe leather epidemiology in the way Martin uh, describes it, which you may not be able to do just because you don't actually want to send people out to meet infected folks, um, you've got to have that human touch and that connection and that understanding of the local context, because you're literally asking people to tell you who they have spent time with. And then they know that you're gonna go find those people and tell them to self uh, isolate. Like you're asking for very, very disruptive things. Last point on this, which I think you alluded to Jennifer in your question, but I, I don't wanna leave, which is that asking folks, if somebody showed up and said, hey, you've been exposed to somebody, Ashish, and you need to isolate yourself for 14 days, I could. I have a reasonably good paying job. I could probably even afford a hotel for 14 days. Harvard would pay me during that time. It would be a little bit painful, but I could do it. Um, that's not an option for a large chunk of people. And so we really need a strategy where we support people during that time, make sure their jobs are protected, make sure they're getting money for food, their families are, are supported. And it's really about supportive isolation. If we don't do that, you're gonna create a massive disincentive for people to be identified and for people to be tested. And that will not be good in terms of controlling. The yes, I mean, the risk that uh, testing positive becomes stigmatizing is um, present, but the risk that the consequences, uh, which include uh, quarantine, will further deprive you of livelihoods and, and um, access to your families, et cetera, is uh, it's quite considerable. Uh, the, um, but Martin, you did not have that particularly um, that particular idiocy afflict your testing strategies, did you? That is, um, testing shows that uh, basically produces the virus. I mean, it was astonishing how this um, logical um, leap into nowhere permeated the entire discussions in the United States. Well, obviously, we look on with wonder at the <laughs> federal government in the same way we look at uh, Brazil and uh, Tanzania and some other places at the minute. It's, uh, uh, well, uh, there is the old Chinese curse about living in interesting times. and We're just glad that we don't live in the over here. Uh, no, I think the government here was clear that it did want to ramp up testing, it just didn't know how to. And it did give it to a, a an accountancy company, in fact. Uh, the, the, the problem with that was, that it wasn't their business model to then go and talk about all the people who could have helped. And there were a lot of people that could have helped. There were people in any National Health Service laboratories who were actually twiddling their thumbs with equipment that was not being used. The veterinary laboratories, all the animal health laboratories that do PCRs on a huge scale, and much of that work had diminished because of shutdowns in agriculture, they could have been involved and they were brought in very late so this idea, just as you were saying about Massachusetts there, she's you know, going out and 
talking to people locally and who can do what can you help uh, it, it's not in the in the business model of these outsourcing companies and it just means that they build a new laboratory then can't find the staff and then they can't find a way of getting the samples to the laboratory who's going to transport it well what they did was they talked to amazon uh, and of course that has strengths and weaknesses uh, and uh, that was the difficulty, but I think they really wanted to know. Uh, it was just that they didn't quite have the ability to do it. But could I pick up just something that you said, Ashish? You know, th this is very interesting watching from the other side of the Atlantic about the way in which not looking for the virus will in some way help the markets because as we have looked at what's happened to the markets it's not been the virus it's the tweets from your president and it may be a tweet attacking china or it may be a tweet saying that we don't want any foreigners flying into the country or something like that but that's what's driven the uh the, the markets rather than the virus which is rather a paradox because you know you're saying he's saying he wants to protect them and then doing lots of things which make them crash now of course the other thing we do know is that volatility benefits some people. And there are a lot of people making a fortune out of that volatility. It just happens to be that it's not the American pensioners uh, that are doing it. They're the ones that are losing. But there are a lot of hedge fund managers and other speculators who are doing very, very well indeed out of all of this. And that will come out in the wash, won't it? I hope. In other words... Well, I don't think it will, because it didn't yeah. with the Brexit referendum here. Uh, there are still too many un unanswered questions. There are the same people uh, that the uh, disaster, you know, what Naomi Klein described as the shock doctrine, the disaster capitalist. And unfortunately, they do seem to survive. So um, what I would like to do is um, switch this to, and it relates to a question from the audience as well. Um, what would you say to the suggestion that actually this is a world pandemic? It's uh, with global implications, obviously. Um, it is killing um, tens of thousands of people. Um, what would you say if standing within the United States or the UK, uh, one were to say, you know what, it might even be better for the states or local areas to manage this pandemic than to rely on the federal government. Uh, what, what parts of our response um, should have been taken up locally um, in the absence of federal action or looking forward, which is probably more productive, um, what sorts of local action, state or town or city, um, might be the best locus for control and thinking um, and community engagement around what next has to happen for the pandemic? You both hinted at that. Um, Ashish, you and then Martin, could you pick it up? Yeah, so I, you know, I've done a lot of thinking about this, watching the American response. And there have been times I thought, thank God we live in a federalist sort of system where um, states can do things without requiring the federal permission. And, 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 and that has made me think um, there are things that states ought to be leading on. on anything where local knowledge and culture and understanding is really, really important. Um, we want local leadership, whatever, however we live with us, a city or a state. Um, and of course, it depends on the size of these things. Uh, but I, I think local leadership is very important. It, anything that requires scale, uh, large resources, where localized knowledge is not the most important. So, you know, thinking about what are the development of a vaccine, that shouldn't be a local thing. Like every city shouldn't be developing its own vaccine. That should be a global effort, uh, certainly a national effort. And so thinking about that and then thinking about the partnerships we need um, is really kind of the model, right? And, and, when, and so for instance, looking at this as a global pandemic, if we could think about, uh, India is gonna take a different strategy than the US and, and different than the UK, and that's appropriate. But there are commonalities, there are issues where if we had more global solidarity, everybody would be better off for it. Um, when countries struggle with testing, if you could have other countries coming in and helping, that would be an immensely useful thing. And because it's a global pandemic, even if you're gonna be very, very self-focused um, about it, when there are outbreaks happening in other places, it makes it hard to contain your own because we live in a globalized world. So. I, I wish as I had, as I've seen this unfold, and we're not done, we're early, 
that we could take an approach where we have certain strategies that are truly global, certain strategies that are just national, and then a bunch of strategies that are local. And that's fine. That's the mix we want. Um, but right now, it feels like there's not a ton of global solidarity. And at least in the US, not much interest in even having a national strategy. And so then almost everything is happening at the local level. And that's not great. So uh, I'd like to return to India, just not right now, but in, in, coming up. Uh, so Ashish, you're um, on alert. At, uh, Martin, um, the idea of going local in the UK um, has real merit to me, um, recognizing that even though the national health system has been defunded, in some ways broken up, you do have a primary health system. And as you said, people know who their local doctor is. Yeah. Um, what do you think about local strategies for keeping people safe as we begin to open up? Well, can I maybe extend it to the European scene? Yes, because please. I think to echo what she said, the uh, actions should be taken by those who have the power to make things happen. And some of those like vaccines are going to be global, but whether you do it at the level of the town or the city or the county or the state or whatever will depend very much on the powers that the authority has at that level. So for example, I also have an apartment, I live in North London, we have an apartment in France. In France, if there's something not going right, you go to the mayor and they will fix it. Here in London, you go to the local authority and they'll say, well, actually that's Westminster. So our members of parliament get involved in all the sorts of things that would not happen in France. In Sweden, it would be the county councils and so on and so forth. So it's quite different in different countries. It depends who has the ability to make things happen. But there is an issue that comes up, which you have in the United States, we have less in Europe, but we have at a global level. What do you do whenever you have an authority, an agency, a, a, a government that is not playing by the rules? Now, the situation that you're going to face is going to be in Florida or Georgia, where frankly, they're manipulating the data. How do you deal with that? We, I think, will have that in some of the conflict affected areas around Europe as well, uh, particularly with the migrant camps, refugee camps and, and so on, uh, but also in some of the countries that are affected like Syria. How do we deal with that? I mean, you also have, of course, um, Central America, El Salvador, uh, Venezuela and so on. And I, I think the challenge for the world is going to be how do you tackle those issues? Because unless we can eradicate this disease everywhere, then it is going to be conti continue to be a threat. And in the absence of any sort of world government, and in fact, with the United States withdrawing from the post-war international order, that is going to be a very, very big challenge. We had a dry run of it, in a way, when Bolsonaro started setting the Amazon on fire with implications for the whole world, and we didn't have a response to that. But now the situation is perhaps even more urgent. So, Ashish, um Going to India, where you have um, Modi, who in some ways has been compared to Bolsonaro or to um, even Trump, uh, and the ways in which um, his direction to the public um, has been well-founded or at times has been um, ill-timed, uh, what, what's your sense about what's going on in India? And then I'm going to switch back fast to some of our vulnerable populations here in the U.S. and in and in the U.K. Okay, but um, let's so, let's go to India because it's pretty fascinating. It is fascinating. Two minutes on India. Um, I'll try, or maybe less. Um, can I say that in some ways Modi's actions have been both well-founded and ill-timed? Um, it's one of the first country, one of the big, you know, few countries that locked down very early before there were large outbreaks, and that has meant that India's case counts have been low, and have grown slowly. And, uh, and that's a good thing. But the lockdown has been enormously costly to, the, to India's poor. And, uh, and I think uh, while there have been clearly some efforts to try to re remedy that, not enough. And then what has happened with the migrant workers has been particularly awful in my mind, in that they basically have been stranded and um, and without much thought or strategy to what do you do with the fact that large numbers of Indians work somewhere else and where they live and could not sustain themselves without work uh, in those areas. So India has been this very interesting mix of big national response, 
some of it poorly timed. But now that it's coming out of the lockdown, we're starting to see cases rise. We're starting to see deaths rise. And, and my worry is not enough of a strategy of what you do next, because you can't stay locked down forever. And lockdowns buy you time. And if you don't use that time wisely, um, you've wasted one of the major reasons to have a lockdown. And I don't think India has done enough to really prepare itself for the upcoming weeks and months ahead. So I'm worried quite a bit about what happens as the lockdown ends. And I'm very worried about the vulnerable populations in India that have been uh, really harmed, even though I largely agree with the policy of having lockdown early. Um, I wish it had been done better. This issue um, in, in India is, is similar for every country now that is looking at how do you come out of lockdown? Unless you have the capacity to um, test and do contact tracing and then provide um, adequate cover and support for those who again need to be put in 14 day quarantine. Um, unless you have those mechanisms in place, then coming out of lockdown is going to just accelerate or move forward the, the second wave. Huh? So that people have to realize that lock down release depends upon these supporting strategies in the society. I mean, I don't see a way of delinking them, right? Exactly. Should, should, Completely yeah. agree with that. Right. Yeah. So, um, so uh, Martin, let me uh, start with you and then um, Ashish, please come in on this. There's a question about nursing homes. Um, and uh, to some extent, it's kind of um, the, the calamity is obvious when you see it retrospectively. Uh, but it is also quite linked to sort of corporate capitalism around healthcare. Um, at least I think it's somewhat linked. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also linked to the demographies of our societies. Um, what should be the strategy now in the future as we begin to do lessons learned, because we're in the midst of having to do that, around nursing homes in the UK? Uh, not have them, have them run differently, have them be smaller, um, you, you know, different kinds of nursing homes for different kinds of illness. What, I know you're not a geriatrician, but you are a magician in mind, so you can think of many things. Well, the first thing to recognize is that it is not inevitable that you're going to get outbreaks in nursing and nursing and care homes. And there are, there are quite a few examples, particularly from Canada, that have been written up. And there may be others that have not made it into the literature I'm unaware of, where it has been perfectly possible to prevent the spread of COVID within the, the care homes. I think one of the challenges that we face, and it is very different in different parts of Europe, because in a number of countries, these care homes are run by local government. Uh, they haven't been privatized. What we've found is, and, and you have it to an even greater degree than we have, uh, the large corporations that make money out of storing people, because one of the ways of ensuring that you have a, a continuing, fairly stable cash flow is to find some way in which somebody else will pay you to store people. And it can be the prison system, um, it can be uh, care homes, it can be migrant detention camps. And uh, these, the, the, all of these act in a way that we, we've described, particularly work uh, that uh, I did with Sanjay Basu, who's now in, in Boston, and David Stuckler, looking at Russian prisons and mine, mining communities in sub-Saharan Africa. They all act as institutional amplifiers. So when you get a case in, then it spreads rapidly, it, the numbers increase, but it spreads out to the community beyond it. And the reality of it is in the UK, patients were discharged from hospital. There was a terrible fear of the, the NHS being overwhelmed by the workload. So there was a push to get people out into care homes. There was some very ill-advised guidance, um, which we can argue about what it actually meant, but which suggested that they were at very low risk, which you, know, you would think bizarre in, in retrospect. And uh, as a consequence, uh, we were actually seeding infection into these homes and then it was coming back into the hospitals. So how would you do it differently? Well, I think we have lots of good examples. Uh, I mean, in the UK, there's a particular problem of funding social care in old age, but other countries have maybe not completely solved that problem, but with long term insurance or with funding by local government, they've got a lot of, they've done a lot better than we have uh, in terms of looking after the, but you've got to remember the United Kingdom within Western Europe is the country that has the lowest uh, amount of money and pensions of anywhere else. Uh, we are very, very mean with our older people. And that is not just when they're at home, but also when they're in care homes. 
Yes, um, Ashish, nursing homes or other vulnerable populations. Um, I, I think we now have a, uh, a sense of the deep fissures in our society in terms of you know, structural violence, structural racism. Um, certainly ageism is part of this. Um, and uh, what do you see as um, opportunities for um, getting out of this hole in nursing, in nursing homes? And uh, I'm not gonna ask you to address structural violence, but it's certainly you, you can if you, if you we, we don't have a tremendous amount of time. Well, let me, let me be brief maybe here and, and make a broader point, which we'll get to nursing homes too, which is that what this pandemic has revealed is if you look at who has been disproportionately infected and who has disproportionately died, uh, it is older people, it's older people in institutions, it's racial and ethnic minorities, it's the poor. Um, they have been way beyond their um, population representation have been infected. And then even holding uh, infection levels constant, they've been much more likely to die. And, um, and I'm not gonna do it any level of justice in 60 seconds to take apart all the factors that drive, you know, drive that. Um, but if we get out of this first phase, first wave that we have just gone through and think about the summer and prepare for the next wave and prepare for the next pandemic and prepare for what kind of society we wanna live in after this pandemic is over and don't pay close attention to all of the factors that drove those, uh, I think that'll be both deeply unfortunate, a massive missed opportunity. We've, uh, there's a lot to be learned here about how we don't do this again. Because the, what has happened in nursing homes in the United States has been nothing short of a travesty. Uh, it was predicted. It was predictable. And we just didn't act. And all of the ways that we've seen racial and ethnic minorities um, affected, I also think was all predictable. Uh, and we didn't act. And so my hope is that we can use at least the summer months to think about not repeating exactly the same mistakes in the fall and taking a very different strategy uh, to disease containment uh, as we hit the second wave. So um, Martin, one minute along those lines about what lies ahead and what should people like you, the two of you and others listening be thinking about in a more proactive mode. And then well, I'm going to open it up to Donna to close. Well, at 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, UK time, there will be a piece coming out in the British Medical Journal that sets out five priorities, one of which is understanding the high burden of disease in Black and Asian and minority ethnic populations. Uh, so maybe I'll just leave it there, but have a look at 10 a.m. UK time tomorrow. Okay, we will. BMJ is always very good reading. Um, so thank you both for uh, uh, participating, for your wisdom, for your capacity to move fast on your feet. Um, this is a lot to cover, but um, I've enjoyed it hugely. And thank you. Um, thank you both very much. Um, and now, Donna, please, if you could close. Thank you. Sure. Well, and thank you, Jennifer, for doing such an amazing job at moderating this discussion today. So much was covered that we could have had separate discussions on each and every one of the issues that you raise. I'm glad we got to so many. Um, and that, you know, we concluded with the fact that this virus does not recognize artificially drawn boundaries, but it does certainly um, recognize the most vulnerable populations disproportionately. Um, and so as these reopening conversations happen and, happen and policies and strategies are being developed, we heard today from the three of you that policymakers really must work hard to build in the protections for those most vulnerable in our society, those already living at or below poverty levels, racial and ethnic minorities, elderly, um, those whose movement is restricted, such as the millions of people living today in refugee settings and in conflict settings and so many others, um, because literally they will suffer in ways that uh, will determine um, who receives what type of care and who lives and dies. Um, and, and also I would add that we must do a far better job at building in protections for healthcare workers on the front line of this crisis. We have a responsibility to pressure governments, industry, and the philanthropy sector to ensure that health workers around the world have the protections and support they need to safely do their jobs and serve all populations in all places. It's, it's a disgrace that the very people who are responsible for treating this insidious disease and caring for its victims 
are not receiving protections they need and they deserve. This week, PHR, in collaboration with the leadership of the World Medical Association and the International Council of Nurses, published a comment piece in the leading medical journal, The Lancet, entitled, Attacks Against Healthcare Personnel Must Stop, Especially as the World Fights COVID-19. And I'm really delighted that next week, our webinar will feature the authors of this piece for a conversation on this important topic. Dr. Richard Horton, who is the editor-in-chief and publisher of The Lancet and PHR board member, will moderate a discussion highlighting the horrific attacks on healthcare workers. So I hope you'll join us um, 12 p.m. Eastern US time next Thursday. Um, and lastly, I just wanna add that today's discussion with our extraordinary panelists only further demonstrates the real critical importance of elevating the voices of doctors and scientists to inform policy discussions at all levels. You are truly remarkable. And you and others like you need to be the leading voices to guide us as we face perhaps the greatest health and human rights challenge in our lifetime. So I wanna thank everyone who joined us for supporting PHR, um, for allowing us to do exactly this, um, put these extraordinary uh, voices out there and we hope you'll join us next week. Until then, everyone please stay safe.